We're back guys, Jack here, and welcome to week two of Apoctober 2021. I'm glad you all enjoyed last week's video. I'm excited that this format of folding in Pokemon content with our other art projects is at least somewhat popular. It's also fun creating Pokemon that share themes with the stories that I write each month with the daily prompts. So far, we've met Macrabra, the screeching Pokemon. That was the design for day seven, a ghost type. Today, we'll meet the design I did for day 14, a normal type. Some of you might already know it, I designed the whole thing live during a stream, but for the rest of you, I hope it's a fun surprise. That'll be at the end of the video. First, I'm going to go through the days 8 through 13, more entries in the log of Celeste Mason. For those of you following along on my Instagram, you might notice that I rewrote the log entry for day 8. The original script was a bit too dark for the overall tone of my story, and I didn't want to freak people out. But other than that, enjoy the most recent week of Apoctober illustrations. Today was strange. I'm not sure how else to describe it. I'm feeling out of sorts right now. I don't even feel much like writing. We discovered a new Enigmorph. It didn't take long to figure out its mortal weakness, bloodlust. The tricky part was how to use that vice against it. I didn't really want to indulge a creature whose only impulse was to kill. Bonnie suggested tiring it out. What does that mean? I asked them. They just looked at my hand. A few hours and several hundred exact duplicates of myself later, and the Enigmorph had its fill of killing. We were able to catch it, and we probably saved a lot of real lives. Even though those clones were soulless, even though... I knew they weren't really me. It still unnerves me how quickly Bonnie came up with that idea. Today I finally investigated that haunted well lead we've been hearing about. Some farmer claimed to hear singing coming from the bottom of a well. I took the trip out to see if it was really an Edigmorph, but I told Bonnie not to come. I still feel weird about... what happened. It wasn't until I was alone at the well that I started to hear the singing. It was eerie and somber, but something about it was strangely comforting. The farmer returned with a few of his friends, and the singing stopped again. My amulet started heating up the way it does when an Edigmorph is weak enough to capture. That's when I realized its weakness. Anxiety. That just hates big crowds. I convinced the farmers to leave, and the moment they did, the singing began again. I spent the rest of the day with the thing, even managing to coax it out of the well. It was hideous. It looked like it had possessed the body of a decomposing donkey. But I decided not to capture it. It was a refreshing reminder that not all of these creatures are dangerous as strange and unsightly as they may be. God help me. My head kills. Damn near everyone in Providence has been kept awake for a week straight thanks to this most recent Edigmorph. Maybe one of the smallest we've encountered so far. Physically, that is. The impact it's had on the city is anything but. Ringing church bells non-stop, crashing through kitchens and slamming doors with pots and pans. No one could catch it, of course, but it's reassuring that some people around here actually made an attempt to stop one of these things for once. We eventually deduced that this enigmorph was pretty much the opposite of the one in the well. Its mortal vice was ego. All it wanted was attention, and that's all it got. Of course no one would ignore it, and there's no way in hell we could get the whole city to just pretend it didn't exist. I was at a loss. I couldn't even think with all of the constant racket echoing in my head. Then Bonnie suggested we try another approach. Not apathy, but flattery. The next time the Enigmorph came around, we cheered it on. Suddenly, it had a captive audience, and it followed us everywhere we went. We kept egging it on until it tired itself out, seemingly content with our reaction. We sealed it away in the amulet, and I have to say, Bonnie, I couldn't have done this one without you. 
now I need a glass of whiskey and a long nap. There's a new wave of crime sweeping Providence. Organized gangs of street-smart thugs that enjoy shooting a man in the back as much as they do a glass of fine red wine. Each gang is a family, each family has a head, and every head in the city bows in submission to Don Luca Carcaradon. Carcaradon first rose to power around the turn of the century, at the virile young age of 65. No one knows how a man now reaching his 90th birthday stands over 7 feet tall, weighs over 350 pounds, and can lift a car clear over his head. No one, except Professor Richard Dorr. In an entry of his journal dated just a week before his untimely death, Dorr claims, I have secured every enigmorph I've encountered in my amulet, but the essence of one remains in our world. Somehow, the Don managed to infuse his blood with that of an enigmorph, and his blood flows on. Carcardon has a daughter, Constance, about my age, I'd reckon. Judging by the photos, I think she's inherited more than just her daddy's good looks. I realize I'm on a deadline now. No doubt Carcardon is aware that the amulet has been opened, and if he gets his hands on more enigmorphs before I can lock them away, This was an interesting one. Not all enigmorphs take on organic forms, though many choose living hosts as their mortal vessels in our world. This most recent enigmorph, however, had a curious mortal vice and an aversion to flesh and bone. A fear of death, the most characteristic trait in all living things, and something unheard of in almost every immortal entity, except one. Guess this thing drew the short straw when they were handing out weaknesses. I'm not sure if it understood that it can't die. I had no way to ask. It took on a collection of assorted fossils from the museum at Brown as its host, and the only way it communicated was by changing the arrangement of the petrified bones to create different animated weapons. I guess it detected them as the oldest thing in the city. Maybe it interpreted that as some form of functional immortality. <laughs> it was almost fun, being chased around in the desolate halls of the museum by a floating scythe until it gashed my arm open. The only way we were able to weaken it enough for it to be captured was to trick it into possessing a mortal vessel. We managed to get it inside of a rat, and the immediate sense of vulnerability it felt in that feeble body reduced it to a small puddle of red goo. The rat is fine, but the fossils got pretty scuffed up. Word got out that the Don put a bounty on the head of Cosette de Bois. Apparently, she had something he wanted. We knew that if he got to her first, it would only be trouble. We set out for Massachusetts as quickly as we could, hoping to warn her before it was too late. She was reluctant to leave. Let me rephrase that. She refused to leave, and she ignored everything we told her. It wasn't until Carcaradon's brutes broke down the door that she seemed to realize the danger that she was in. Luckily, she had backup. An army of tiny glowing crabs, unlike anything I'd seen before, seemed to materialize around her at the first sign of danger. They were surprisingly capable of standing up to the gangsters, and we managed to get out of there alive. Turns out those crabs were what the Dom was looking for all along. A hive mind of enigmorphs with a very useful mortal weakness, subservience. They bind themselves to a master and serve them without hesitation in the name of their waxen mother. Cosette had taken on the role of ambassador to the mother, and so they answer to her. If she told them to hop into the amulet, they'd do it by choice. But I decided to leave them be. Neither they nor Cosette are harming anyone. In fact, they're the ones who need protection. I'm letting them stay in the basement of the door manor for now. Grandma is 
not happy about it. Day 13 marks the last of Celeste journal entries for this week, and if you're here for Pokémon, this is a good place to skip to. Now we're going to look at Day 14's prompt, a new normal type for the Mazel region. I feel like Dunsparce might be one of the Pokémon that people want an evolution for the most. If you look up just Dunsparce on Google Images, you find fake evolutions almost immediately, and a lot of them are pretty cool. I think the reason for this, and this is just my take on it, is because Dunsparce feels somewhat incomplete. Let me elaborate on that. I think Dunsparce works well as a design on its own. It looks like a single stage Pokemon, but the nature of its design is very strange. Most people agree that it's based off of a Japanese cryptid known as the Tsukinoko, a tiny round snake-like creature. Makes sense. But what I love about Dunsparce is that it manages to be even weirder than its abstract point of influence. It's just a very enigmatic Pokémon overall. It isn't featured in any major Pokémon movie, it's difficult to find in every game that it's actually in, and I'm pretty sure it was only in like one episode of the anime. And as many people find it weird and undesirable as others find it cute. Where was I going with this? Oh, oh yeah, my favorite part of Dunsparce was how strange it is. And that's what my focal point for my evolution of the Pokémon was going to be. Enigma was the word I kept in my head. It describes Dunsparce so well, and of course it ties in with the rest of the Apoctober world. I thought the best way to represent that was with a silhouette shaped like a question mark. I also knew that I wanted this Mon to be a part flying type, really just because we don't have a lot in the region so far. I know a lot of you are probably wishing I leaned more into a Quetzalcoatl kind of look with this giant winged serpent, but it just felt too redundant after our fire starters. People from the stream might remember me saying that I didn't want this design to have any clear source of reference. Just go nuts with it. I also have to thank the stream for giving me ideas like the floating wings, and the name, Dunsended. Dunsended, the Enigma Pokémon. Scientists in the Maza region have been baffled over the transition between Dunsparce and its evolution, Dunsended. Because they are so rare, they are incredibly difficult to study. For years, they were thought to be little more than a myth, and only ever seen by individuals without any confirmation of their existence. Part of what makes them so elusive is their ability to soar overhead without making any noise at all, despite their great size. Most people dismiss Dunsended sightings as mere clouds. There you have it you guys, week 2 of October has come to a close. Hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope you like the new Pokémon. Oh, just because I know people are going to ask, there's not going to be a Maza regional variant for Dunsparce. This is just a plain evolution. If you'd like a more in-depth look at my process and opportunities to ask me questions in real time, be sure to check out my stream. I'll be working on Apoctober illustrations all month. The link is in the description. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll see you all in the next video.